curiosity, Mrs. Fletcher, and nothing more. I do hope you don't construe this as an agreement with your proposal that we collaborate on a play. You know how I feel about mysteries. Well, that's why I wanted your opinion on my idea. I knew that you would give it a frank appraisal. Won't you sit down? Don't say I didn't warn you. The setting of the story is the theater. The victim is a powerful critic. Oh, dear. Art imitates life. Our killer is very meticulous, but he also has a flair for the dramatic. He plans his murder to coincide with the opening of a new mystery play. After the curtain comes down, the killer goes to the critic's apartment. They know each other, and even though the critic is working on his review of the show, he lets the killer in. Once inside, the killer shoots his victim. The killer erases from the computer disk the bad review his victim has been writing and replaces it with a rave review the murderer wrote earlier and took with him on his own disk. He calls the police with an anonymous tip that later proves to be partially incorrect, making it look as if he's been framed, which of course he has, but by himself. This is why I don't like mysteries. This anonymous tip achieves what? He knows the police will ultimately determine the time of death to be two hours earlier. Once he's been cleared, it's extremely unlikely that he'd be accused again. But to be cleared, he must have an alibi. He has the best. He was appearing live on television when the phony review was received in the newspaper. Quite a brilliant touch. But I can't imagine how he could be in two places at the same time. Oh, he wasn't, of course. Everyone assumed that the phony review was transmitted from the victim's apartment, as his reviews usually were. But it was actually transmitted from the killer's own computer at the television station, while he was on the air delivering his review of the same play. A bit far-fetched, but Quite brilliant. I doff my chapeau to you, Madam Authoress. What we're dealing with here is a perfect crime. It could be perfect, yes, except that Moliere was right. In, in, in what respect? The theater is unpredictable. You see, Mr. Easterbrook, there was a cast change opening night. And since you came in late, you missed the announcement and used the name of the wrong actor in your TV review and in the phony review you wrote under Mr. O'Mara's name. I see we've switched from the third person to the second. Even a fictional judge and jury would hardly accept that as proof. True, but they would accept the TV station's phone log. I beg your pardon. Your station's log shows a five-minute call to the Chronicle at 11.15, exactly the time it took to transmit the phony review. <clears throat> Even the finest works of art have their flaws. Congratulations, Mrs. Fletcher. The only thing missing is a motive. Yes, I wondered about that. Imagine a young and impressionable writer who has his first play produced off, off, off Broadway. It's not perfect, but he has talent and it's a start. And imagine a critic from a second-rate newspaper trying to make a name for himself. His review of the play is devastating, so devastating the young playwright never writes another play. No, instead, he becomes a critic himself and vows to best his destroyer at his own game. But it's not enough. It's not enough to eradicate the pain. Only one thing can do that. Mr. Easterbrook. The detective in the wings, Mrs. Fletcher. I suppose I should have expected a climax so cliché. You know, personally, I like this guy's ending. But there's one thing that bothers me. How did you know the TV station logged their phone calls? Well, if they don't, 
they ought to.